Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Imagine Austin Speaker Series. Um, my name is Sam Tedford, and I'm a planner with um, the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. And this speaker series is, at its core, an opportunity to grow the Im implementation of Imagine Austin through shared dialogue and mutual learning. We invite targeted thought leaders from around the world to present on ideas that affect our community's past, present, and future on topics ranging from mobility and housing to the natural and built environment to community health and social equity, all in efforts to collectively grow and further the implementation of the vision policies set forth in the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. Um, for our format tonight, we'll begin with a presentation from our wonderful speaker and then follow it with a discussion period um, in which you will all have an opportunity to ask your questions um, to the speaker. Um, the event tonight is going to be is filmed by ATXN and it's also being live streamed. And so the video from tonight's presentation will be available on the Imagine Austin website. Um, and so you can share it with those who couldn't make it tonight if you'd like. Uh, the Imagine Austin Speaker Series is hosted by the City of Austin Planning and Zoning Department, and the event tonight is a collaboration between Imagine Austin and the City of Austin's Development Services Department, Community Tree Preservation Division. Um, but before we hear from our incredible speaker tonight, I'd like to hand it over to the Director of the Development Services Department, Rodney Gonzalez, to say a few words. Thank you, Sam. I am the person before Dr. Beatley. Let's see. Welcome to the Imagine Austin Speaker Series. I'm Rodney Gonzalez. I'm the director for the Development Services Department. And uh, I, I'm also excited, like Sam is, to uh, be here today to introduce Dr. Timothy Beatley of the Biophilic Cities Network. The network is leading the way in connecting cities like Austin that value our environment and who want to find ways to bring more nature into our urban and suburban settings. I know personally that people thrive when they have a regular dose of nature, and as I told the group earlier at noontime, about three weeks ago I had my own dose of nature, thus the allergies. So forgive the coughing, sneezing, hacking, hacking and uh, constant uh, battles with uh, my sinuses. The Development Services Department is committed to serving our community and to protecting our community's character and way of life by supporting responsible development and initiatives like this. We're here today to, to think outside of the park. And when I say that, I really mean it because you're going to hear of examples where cities have literally expanded their park systems beyond the traditional boundaries. So how do we as Austinites take elements that we find in our much beloved Austin parks and bring them out into the city? My our streets and buildings become parks too. We look today to other cities around the world uh, and what they are doing to accomplish this and to be inspired and to aspire and to imagine how we can make Austin a more biophilic city in the decades to come. To get more involved in, in this initiative, I encourage you and I invite you to find Nature in the City in Austin on Facebook. I found it. It's spectacular. Plenty of articles, plenty of events, as well as on Twitter and Instagram at NaturallyATX. Now, a little bit about today's Imagine uh, Austin presenter, Dr. Beatley. Dr. Beatley is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for over 25 years. Much of Dr. Beatley's work focuses on the subject of sustainable communities and creative strategies by which cities and towns can fundamentally reduce their ecological footprints, while at the same time being more livable and more equitable. Dr. Beatley believes that sustainable and resilient cities represent our best hope for addressing today's environmental challenges. Dr. Beatley is the author and co-author of more than 15 books on these subjects, including Green Urbanism, Learning from European Cities, Habitat Conservation Planning, Native to Nowhere, Sustainable or Sustaining Home and Community in a Global Age, and Planning for Coastal Resilience. Please welcome Dr. Timothy Beatley. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Good. Uh, apologies if you happen to see this earlier in the day. This is sort of the second version of this that I've given. And I, after spending the day here in Austin and I listened to the code discussions just now, uh, I'm, I'm even more appreciative of all the things you're doing here. I think 
probably you're not going to learn a lot. I don't know. You're already doing so many of these things uh, here in Austin. But Austin has uh, joined our Biophilic Cities network, and we're very excited about that, and we're looking forward to collaborating around that in the future. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this Biophilic Cities network that we have, uh, tell you a bit about what, what this concept of a biophilic city is, and tell you a little bit about what our cities in the network are doing. So uh, after hearing everything today and having discussion, a really good discussion following the earlier presentation, I, I frantically tried to find uh, slides to add to, to my presentation. And I not, wasn't very successful, but I did add a few. I didn't subtract any. So uh, that's a problem. We'll, we'll, we'll see how, how it goes. OK. So uh, the first thing to say is maybe the obvious, which is that we are uh, you know, a highly urbanizing planet. We've passed that 50% of the planet living in cities. We're not going to turn that back. And most of us, I'm a city planner, most of us recognize the great advantages of living in cities. Uh, but we have a huge uh, sustainability challenge and a huge resilience challenge. And most of us are arguing for the need to densify cities, to, for cities to become more compact, for us to invest in transit and renewable energy, all those things that we need to, to uh, become a sustainable planet. As, as it's been said many times, there will be no sustainability without sustainable cities. So that's a challenge. Um, but we also believe that we need to have connection with nature. We need to have contact with the natural world. And can you do that? at the same time that you're densifying uh, cities? Can you have those dense cities and, and contact with nature? And it's a question mark on this slide, um, but I'm definitively answering yes. And that's essentially what the Biophilic Cities project uh, has been uh, about. So we started this project in around 2012. I have to give a lot of credit to, to E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard. He wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia. But he, he uses it, he, he's kind of coined it in the way that we use it today, this idea that we have an innate uh, affiliation or an innate connection to, to nature, that we're hardwired. Uh, he wouldn't use that word, probably, but that we carry with us our ancient brains, right? We've co-evolved in that natural world. So it's not a big surprise that we're happier, healthier, able to meet, lead more meaningful lives when we have nature uh, around us. And so that's a key premise of the Biophilic Cities network and project. And it's nature. The idea is that it's, it's not something optional. It's something absolutely essential. And it can't be just something you get occasionally on a vacation, a, a summertime trip, which may be fantastic. But we've got to have nature all around us. We've got to have nature that we experience on a daily if not hourly basis. So that means we've got to have it uh, around us in the neighborhoods where we live and the places where we work. And so it's a huge design and planning challenge and one that I'm increasingly finding that you're tackling here in Austin after hearing a lot about this uh, uh, today. Here's Ed Wilson again, uh, great quote, the human species has grown up in nature. We have as a species. It's only been a tiny little bit of our evolutionary uh, history that we've been in, in. This is a beautiful room. Very often I'm teaching in a her hermetically sealed buildings without nature and without natural light. But it's a uh, relatively small part of our, our evolutionary story. So not a big surprise, again, that we're, we feel more comfortable, we're calmer, we're happier when we have nature uh, around us. Uh, my, my good friend and colleague, Stephen Kellert, some of you know about Stephen's work. He's uh, done a lot of writing with Ed Wilson about biophilic design and un unfortunately passed away in the, in the fall. Very inspirational person for a lot of us. And he used to talk about biophilia as being this uh, weak genetic tendency. And he didn't mean to downplay it by using the word weak, but he believes that it's something, it's innate, but it requires uh, you know, some work on our part. It's kind of like a muscle that we have to use. So that's a kind of key premise here as well, that we've got to, we, we can't just expect this innate love, or this innate connection to nature to, to be always felt or always expressed. We've got to find ways to, to facilitate that. Those, those connections. And that's a lot of what a biophilic city can be. So this is actually an image from a new documentary film that we've been making. 
actually about, about cities and oceans and with a, a strong emphasis on the connection we have to water and the way that water and way that aquatic and, and marine environments make us feel. So in January, uh, we followed a group of about 50 fifth, gra fifth graders into the water. They, they walked out, didn't have to swim, but they walked, waded out into, you know, kind of waist-deep water. It was the Atlant Atlantic Ocean. This is a program uh, put on by the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, Biscayne Nature Center in Miami. And it was really quite remarkable. So they split into groups of five or seven, and the kids, every two uh, students got a little uh, net, and they were shown how to kind of scoop, you know, this, the surface of, of the, the floor of the ocean there and, and pull it up and see what they, they discovered. And it was really remarkable to, to watch it. And these are kids that hadn't had a lot of connection to, to water or to the marine environment that wasn't really very far away from where they lived. And it was just remarkable to see this, fast, this awe and fascination and wonder when they saw the stuff that came up out of the water, and, and uh, I didn't recognize us, a lot of it myself. There was, I was telling earlier, the, one of the things that came up, on, uh, up in a net, and, and it was, all the students were awestruck, was this, this what looked like a tennis ball, this inflated yellow, and it turned out to be a puffer fish. And the kids were like, what is that? And then they put it down into the, they had a little floating tank. Um, where all the things, all the specimens were collected. And, and they watched as the puffer fish deflated. And it, it was a fish again. And it was just remarkable. So we tried to capture this on film, and we, we followed them into the ocean with cameras, and it was quite a, quite a little spectacle. But it was a demonstration, I think, of what we need to do to kind of activate that, that biophilic sensibility that we all carry with us it's, it just does require some, some exercising. Um, so we started this thing in 2012, the Bioflex Cities project. It was, uh, in the beginning, a research project. We had funding from the Summit Foundation, a Washington, D.C.-based uh, foundation. We did a lot of our work uh, through 10 cities, looking at, at 10 cities uh, around the U.S. and around the, the world, cities like Singapore, Wellington, New Zealand, Vittoria Gestez, the capital of the Basque Country in, in Spain. And our objectives were to sort of find out what cities, what the best cities were doing to design nature in, to, to incorporate nature into their design and, and planning. And then on the last day or the last phase of this work, we brought everybody to Charlottesville, Virginia, where I live, and we had a four-day conference. And on the last day of that conference, um, everybody went out on our downtown mall, and we had this sort of big publisher's clearinghouse-sized uh, pledge, Biophilic Cities pledge, and they signed it in great dramatic fashion. This is Lena Chan, from, uh, who heads the National Biodiversity Center in Singapore. And, and, and it occurred to all of us that this was the beginning of a mo an urban movement, really, and that we, should, we need a network. And that's really what, that what became uh, a launching of our global network, and that was 2013. So since that time, um, we've done a lot of things. And just to back up, uh, we have a new logo. We have a new web page, and we're actually on our way to another, uh, an even newer web page in about two weeks. Um, I have a couple of tasks for you tonight, a couple of assignments. One is to uh, find at least three ways to use the word biophilic over the next day's conversation, right? Work it in to, to you know, you have to explain what it is. And, and uh, so that's one assignment. The second one is go to our website, which is biophiliccities.org. And you can actually join the network as an individual or an organization, and you just go online and sign a pledge. And you can surf around and see a little bit about what we're up to and what the network is, is all about. Um, it's been exciting especially the last few months, Austin has joined, yay. Um, but we've also had other cities. Um, just last week or two weeks ago, St. Louis. I've got some slides from St. Louis to show you. Pittsburgh, uh, Washington, D.C., Edmonton, Canada. And in fact, a lot of the rest of the slides I have are slides about those cities and some of the things that they're doing. So, so it's gaining traction. We've been describing it as a global movement. That may be a bit, a bit presumptuous of us, uh, but we think it is. 
And we think it represents, one of the, one of the reasons it, 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 it's so uh, compelling and so um, gaining such traction is I think, it, especially now, we know all the things we need to do to be sustainable and to be resilient. And we know all the, uh, the things we've got to do. But in a sense, the sustainability agenda has sometimes been about you know, hitting us over the head and telling us what we can't, you know, we've got to consume less, and we've got to use less energy, and we've got to reduce our carbon footprint. But the biophilic cities concept and movement is really about mapping out a future we want, a, a vision of the kind of places we want to live in. And they're you know, places that are profoundly natureful, and that's, that's the main point. So um, we've discovered, actually, that there's a need for this inner city uh, network, but we've discovered, actually, within our partner cities, there's also a need for an intra-city network. So we've been helping uh, grassroots organizations form in, in various cities, mostly in the US at this point. One of the orga new organizations is called Biophilic DC. That's Washington, DC. And they had a lot to do, actually, with the grassroots campaign to get the DC City Council to adopt the Biophilic Cities Resolution and to be part of the network. These are actually images uh, from the building at the University of the District, District of Columbia, where we had our, our launch event, our kind of celebratory event in Washington. And every, every city, each city is doing some, something a little bit different and a little bit special. And uh, in Washington, um, there is an initiative around food. And so this is actually a picture of Dean Sabine O'Hara. She uh, is dean of this really uh, innovative uh, uh, sustainability school at UDC. And she's helping to spearhead this uh, effort to, to establish urban food hubs throughout the city of Washington. It's a really interesting uh, story. And actually, these images are from the roof of her building which is itself a story. It's a, it's a uh, rooftop garden, uh, eight, 18 inches of soil produced uh, uh, actually especially along the edges of the building where the building where you have the, the strongest reinforcement for that kind of deeper soil. And they're producing a remarkable amount of food and it's very biophilic. So much food that they're actually operating a CSA um, out of the ground floor. So uh, a community supported agriculture. So shares that people are coming and getting uh, every week from food grown on the roof. So uh, that's Washington, uh, one of our recent uh, um, members. Edmonton, Canada has recently joined as well. Edmonton's a really amazing story of a northern city and a city that has been getting a lot of attention, in fact, for its efforts at, at imagining itself as an ecosystem. It is an ecosystem, doing everything, all the design and planning and all the Projects, public and private, have to sort of connect to this ecological network. And in particular, an emphasis on movement of wildlife and animals in this city. So it's become a bit famous. It's just completed, I think, its 27th wildlife passage in, in the city. So this idea that small passageways, but also rather large ones, underpasses and overpasses and, and landscape connect connections in the city that allow the movement of of animals through that city. And that's a key sort of goal. And they have uh, new design guidelines that apply to, to building any kind of new infrastructure. Really interesting. I mentioned earlier that we've, uh, we have a, a film, a new film that we've made uh, about Edmonton. And we, in, in going through the production of this film, it was a collaboration with a, a filmmaker, a filmmaking company, and our colleagues in Edmonton. And the first draft of this film about Edmonton, it was all about the beautiful summer nature in, in that city. And if any of you have spent any time in Edmonton, particularly in December or January, it's a wintry city. So our colleagues in Edmonton had this reaction to the film, well, that's nice, but half the year, it doesn't look anything like that. The nature is quite a bit different. So um, this, by the way, was from a, an event that we had in June. And uh, um, it's Grant Pearsall in the middle, who, who is the head of biodiversity and parks for the city of, of Edmonton. We had 250 people come out to the Edmonton Public Library to celebrate the city joining the Biophilic Cities Network, which we were, were quite impressed by that. So they've been trying to figure out how, you know, part of the challenge of being a biophilic city is how do you get outside? How do you make sure, how do you propel people outside? 
because that's, you know, more than 90% of our day is spent indoors. And we have to think about the nature of indoor environments, but we also, Bifolk City is a city that aspires to, you know, to, to it's that exercising that muscle, getting us out, out you know, tempting us um, with that outdoor life. So in Edmonton, they've developed a winter strategy to, to do that, essentially. And it's really quite interesting. They have, um, this is the third year, I think, that they've built this huge ice castle. It's the place to, to see. Um, they're, uh, they've adopted a set of uh, uh, winter urban design guidelines. So how do you create warming stations and, and places in the city where there are evergreen trees that block the wind and, and, and make it a tad bit more pleasant to be outside? And uh, there was a master's student, an uh, architecture master's student, who came up with this very interesting uh, idea called the freezeway. Have you heard about this? The idea of being able to commute, perhaps, uh, to work on skates. So uh, the city is now calling them ice ribbons, which is really, really cool. Uh, and Chicago has now taken this idea, inspired by Edmonton, and they have they had some they had at least one big ice ribbon this year. It was more kind of on a track and less about you know commuting to work, but an interesting idea. So this is one of the challenges. Uh, Particularly northern latitude uh, cities, you know, where where the weather may not be great for being outside. Pittsburgh uh, joined us, uh, joined the network in the fall, uh, and we've been enjoying getting to know that city. Again, every city has its own special uh, context and its own special nature. In in Pittsburgh, it's about connecting to the three rivers and getting more people in direct contact with that water. And so they have a water trail for canoes and kayaks, and they have a, a whole strategy of new parks for, get it for along the river, including this park, which uh, on the left, which is a floodable park, a resilient park that uh, sometimes you know, may be rather watery, um, but other times is available for, uh, for recreation. They're, they're quite proud of their tree canopy coverage of 42%. I heard earlier today Austin is 37%. Did I hear that correctly? The, <laughs> a couple of different numbers, couple of different numbers yeah. around. That's yeah, very good. From 34 to 37. 34 to 37 or 30. Yeah. Okay, that's great as well. Um, but we, we don't mind a little friendly competition between the biophilic cities and our network. And, and Atlanta, I think, is no, 48, 48 maybe or something. Really? <laughs> yes. Well, it's all, that's right. There are uh, questions about how you calculate it. So, so uh, this is Mayor Peduto, Peduto in, uh, in, um, in Pittsburgh. We had a, a major celebratory event there at the Phipps Conservatory, a, a wonderful biophilic um, facility there, and actually a new living building, uh, a certified living building uh, a structure, uh, and, and lots of really cool things happening in, in Pittsburgh. This is a global movement, so we have uh, a lot of cities around the world uh, that we're uh, talking with and, and, and hopefully will be joining the network. One of them is Chengdu, China. We spent some time uh, there in the fall. Uh, they have done, been doing some remarkable things already, including this, uh, this remarkable uh, ecological ring that circles the center of the city, a city of about 10 million. And this is a network of wetlands and green spaces, and it will do many different things for the city, including flood uh, retention, which is a major, major goal. So a number of things that we're up to with this network. We've uh, been disseminating a lot of information. We've been telling the compelling stories of, of cities in the network. We have a brand new Biophilic Cities Journal. This is all, by the way, online. Uh, if you want to you see the inaugural issue of the Biophilic Cities Journal, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to, to find it. Uh, so we've had, we're on our third or fourth webinar series uh, now. We've been making films, uh, uh, as I said, about the many of these cities. One of the, the films I'd recommend is the 45-minute film we did about Singapore. If you want to find it, it's all on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, uh, so you could Google Singapore Biophilic City. It's been very interesting to us um, how films and filmmaking, um, you can talk and you can even show photographs, but there's something very powerful about putting a camera in front of someone and having them talk about 
their neighborhood or their project or their city. And that's essentially what we do. So they're relatively low budget films. You'll see this when you, if you watch them. But the Singapore film, as an example, has been widely watched. And I think it's got 60,000 views or something in a relatively short uh, period of time. So we're hoping that there will be a movie, a film about Austin. And so every uh, city in the, in the um, um, network will hopefully have at least one film, maybe more. So uh, this is just to carry on uh, with the filmmaking uh, idea. And these are some images from uh, our filming in Baltimore. A very interesting program by the Baltimore uh, Parks and Rec Department to get uh, kids from uh, neighborhoods not very far away from, from the Inner Harbor, but, but kids that have, for the most part, never, never done this, never been on the water, never didn't, don't have that kind of direct contact with, with that water, water nature. So to back up a little bit, uh, what do we know about the evidence? Um, and what do we know about the reasons for caring about biophilic cities? This is probably the slide with the most text on it in the entire presentation. So there are many reasons. And uh, as the title to the talk uh, suggests, there are some really important mental health benefits. We know that uh, contact with nature uh, calms us. It, it, reduces our stress levels. Long-term chronic stress is probably the you know, single most serious health issue that we face in cities, I would say, or one of the really big ones. And nature, uh, we, we respond in, in really positive uh, ways to nature. Nature uh, enhances our cognitive uh, abilities. It makes us feel better. Uh, we have evidence about the power, the social, uh, the social building, social capital building dimensions of of, uh, of nature. Nature brings us together as a species. We have all this evidence now about uh, if, you, if you have a deeper, more extensive network of friends, you're more likely to be healthier. We, mortality from cancer goes down uh, with a, a, a more extensive network of friends. Nature is not the only thing that will bring us together, but there's something very special about nature, a power that nature has to foster friendships and to, and to bring uh, uh, people together in communities. We have a lot of evidence actually coming out of um, experimental psychology uh, that we are more likely to be generous in the presence of nature. We're more likely to be cooperative in the presence of nature. Uh, we're more likely to be better human beings when we have nature around us. Maybe, again, not a big uh, surprise. Evidence coming out of economics that we're more likely to think longer term if we have nature uh, uh, around us. Uh, I also believe in the importance of wonder. Um, you know, we don't talk enough about wonder and awe uh, and the important opportunities in cities. I I'm often talking about biophilic cities as cities that maximize potential moments of awe. So we ought to be able to walk through a city and experience uh, a natureful, uh, awe-inspiring moment. And they're happening all around us, of course, and we're, we're often not paying attention. Um, and then finally, it, a lot of us in planning are, are talking about resilience. You know, we have the 100 resilient cities. And, um, and, and understandable uh, and, and necessary uh, planning emphasis, resilience. I do a lot of work in that area as well. And I would say that, that virtually anything that we can do to make a city more natureful, to make it more biophilic, will also make it more resilient, whether that means uh, trees and forests to cool urban environments or uh, green rooftops and green walls to retain stormwater, all those things that almost anything that you can think of um, to grow more nature in the city will make that city more resilient. So uh, we could spend the whole time that I have just on the evidence of the power of nature. It's, uh, it cha it's changing, it's growing uh, almost daily. This is from two weeks ago, uh, an article in Bioscience, actually a, a University of Exeter in the UK a study showing that there's a connection between, uh, you know, ha how present birds are. If you're likely to, to live in a neighborhood, if you're, if you're living in a neighborhood where you're more likely to see birds, your mental health is, li is likely to be better. So your depression, anxiety, and stress will be lower. We're still, you know, working on causality. These are all, this is all kind of correlational, but pretty compelling to me and, and pretty convincing uh, for the most part. Some of you know about the work, the long-standing work coming out of Japan around this concept of forest bathing. 
this idea that as you walk through a forest, at the end of that walk, you know, the, all the beautiful, the sights, the sounds, the dappled light, the experience of walking in that forest, at the end of that walk, uh, Japanese have found that your stress hormone levels go down, that walk will boost your immune system. Not a big surprise, again. And, and the Japanese are so convinced about this that they've established a network of forest therapy stations in, in cities around that country. So uh, again, we, we have this sort of growing evidence. Um, this is a study that hasn't been published yet, but uh, from researchers at the University of Minnesota, uh, showing that um, if, you're, if you're waiting at a transit stop or a bus, station, st bus stop, if, you're, if that station, that stop has trees around, your perceived wait time will be lower. Uh, so nature has this ability to kind of make us, uh, to sort of soften you know, the urban edge and the other uh, 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 stresses that we find in urban living. A few years ago, we did a, a, a documentary film called The Nature of Cities, and actually we filmed, uh, we filmed here at the Lady Bird Johnson Center, and we filmed the bats. I have a, a slide uh, in just a minute to, about, about uh, Mexican free-tailed free bats. Um, this is in a story in, from that film. It's playing on PBS for a while. This is five, six years ago. The, the entire film, it's called The Nature Cities, and it's all online if you want to watch it. Uh, but these are two best friends who are uh, tracking. They're amateur wi urban wildlife trackers. So they uh, are fascinated. They're, they're able to distinguish the finer points of a, of a domestic cat's paw print versus a bobcat's paw print. And that, so we decided we were going to film them one day. And we, it was quite interesting. We had trouble keeping up with them. And they were going down trails. And at a certain point, they went off the trail. And we, we heard the rustling. And we weren't sure what was going on. And then we heard this ecstatic yelping. And they had just discovered some blood on a branch. And they thought they were just seconds away from seeing the, the resident female bobcat that they were hoping to see. And uh, for us, it was an epiphany because they told us on the film, they talk about this on the film, that, that, that this nature is what brought them together. They're best friends. But the neighborhoods around this canyon, this is one of the sort of skipped over, many skipped over canyons in San Diego, Rose Canyon. And this neighborhood is quite, the, the neighborhoods around the canyon are quite diverse. But the thing they have in common, the thing that brings them together is, the, is this canyon. Uh, so anyway, it's a, an, a, a, an example of the social building, the social capital building potential of nature in biophilic cities. So what are biophilic cities? I've given you a little bit of, uh, you know, already a little suggestion about some of the things. It's, a, you know, ideally a city that propels us outside. It's a city that, you know, puts us in contact with nature, that fosters that connection, that connectedness to nature and, our, and, and ourselves. Um, we could express the biophilic urbanism idea or, or city idea in many different ways. I mentioned the, the online pledge. This is a version of it, so we could express this idea in words. Uh, the idea of putting nature at the center of our design and planning, the idea of, of emphasizing the importance of biodiversity, nature, wildness in our design and planning, and that's what urban life ought to ought to be about, fostering connections and connectedness to, to uh, nature. Uh, many of our cities in the network are going uh, even a little bit further than this. And I hadn't quite realized the, um, the history of the, the, the slogan or you know, Austin as a city and a park. And I, I, I wonder where that, has that been around for a long time, I wonder? Uh, we'll have to find out. <laughs> A new, a new, yeah. Well, I, I think it's time to bring it back. So one of the main points I often make is that we are now, we're moving from a model of cities. You know, for a while, we had trouble even imagining nature in cities. Nature and cities were these sort of polar opposites, right? We've gotten over that. But I think we're still stuck in, in a model of cities and nature that sees nature as, as being in particular places in cities. So we go to that nature. We live in a city, and we go down the street to the park to find that nature, or we visit a forest uh, at some distance away, uh, or we get in our car and go, go to a, you know. And that's, those spaces are, are important. We like parks, of course. But the, the new model is really 
uh, let's change the way we see the very, the very idea of a city. So why must we think of nature as being in that park? Why don't we imagine ourselves living in the park? That's essentially what your motto says. Uh, why don't we see our, our city as a garden or see our city as a forest? We don't go to visit the forest. Our city is a forest. We're living in the forest. And that's what a number of our cities are doing. Singapore is perhaps the best example. They've recently changed their motto from Singapore a garden city to Singapore a city and a garden, which is a small change, but a very significant one indeed. And so Singapore is an interesting model uh, for us to look at. Uh, and uh, this is an example of a recent, one of the recent uh, buildings in, in that city. We've gotten to know Woha, the architects of this. It's, it's a hotel called Park Royal. And it, is, uh, it redefines the very nature of a building. It's a very living sort of building. It's in remarkable sky gardens and hanging green uh, nature. And, and, and it, it, it's actually an expression of uh, a policy, that a, a requirement that the city now imposes, this thing called the landscape replacement policy. So if you build something in Singapore, you have to replace the nature lost at the ground level by the footprint of the building. You have to replace that in the form of vertical greenery. So at least one to one. And what's going on now is friendly competition in that city. There's a building under construction that's replacing ground level nature 900 uh, percent, actually by the same WOHA uh, architects. So uh, the, the model that Singapore is, is implementing is this idea of having multiple layers. You have a forest canopy. Uh, and that forest canopy connects. There's, there's canopy level. There's ground level park space. There's uh, there green, green roofs and green vertical green elements that, that ideally connect with that forest canopy cover. So you, you have you know, this, in, this emerging idea of a fully integrated uh, ecological urban system. And that's really what we need to imagine, and a, a nature immersive uh, city. So that's remarkable. Uh, this is an, one of the stories we tell in this biophilic uh, Singapore film online is the KTPH, which is a remarkable hospital. It's probably the, the most biophilic hospital or health facility I've ever seen. We had a, a wonderful time um, uh, learning about it and filming the story. And this is the, the CEO, and he talks on the film about how the standard, the design requirement of this, uh, this hospital was as you see here, you know, it has to not just heal patients, which is a key, key aspect, but as you, as you check into this, 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 this uh, hospital, your blood pressure should go down, not up. Your stress levels should go down, not up, up, up. Hospital visits are almost, by definition, stressful, right? And this is a hospital that actually in the climate makes this easier, but this is not a walled-off hospital this is actually a place where high school students come to do their homework in the afternoon. It's a garden, and it's a hospital in a garden. Everything's in a garden in Singapore now. <laughs> it's remarkable. Uh, the other uh, really impressive thing about this and many of the other things being built in Singapore under this model uh, is that they're judging the outcome, uh, the success of this building in some really interesting ways. As you see in that second quote, uh, this is meant to be restorative. So they're judging the success of this, of this hospital by the numbers, number of species of butterflies and birds that they count. And they have a running tally on several walls in the hospital. An interesting way of thinking about how we build in the city. Um, other cities, uh, Melbourne, Australia, we've been in, in discussion with them. We hope they'll join the, the network. They have just adopted a, a, a very progressive uh, very ambitious uh, urban forestry, urban forest strategy. They're aspiring to double their tree canopy coverage uh, by 2040. What's more remarkable, though, is that they are aspiring, as they, they're explicitly saying, we don't want to just have more trees in the city. We want, uh, we want to be a city in a forest. And that's how they're seeing themselves, seeing their city. You may have heard a little bit about them. They've, they've, they've uh, been uh, engaging in some, uh, they've been using some interesting public engagement techniques. Um, it got, it's gotten some international attention. So every tree in the city has its own unique number. It's on a GIS uh, system. Uh, and every tree in the city has its own unique email address. So you are encouraged to send a loving email to your favorite tree 
That's biophilia, love of nature. You can actually, and the tree will email you back. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty interesting as well. So we actually had the, the head of that program did a webinar for us. It's on, on our webinar on our YouTube channel if you're interested. And she talks about all the, she has these great examples of what people say, <laughs> what they say to trees that they love. And we need to encourage more of that. And, and, uh, and people from all over the world, actually, they didn't live in, people not just living in Melbourne, but all over the place. Uh, I guess they know some of the trees in Melbourne. I don't know. Um, so that's interesting, this immersive nature. A lot of other uh, ways that we could express the urban design idea or the, the city planning notions of a biophilic city integrated, multi-scaled, green space and nature. This is a, a, a map of, of Helsinki. Uh, and Helsinki has a wonderful green network, um, and it's integrated. And so this idea of whole of city, so we're, we want nature around us where we're working and where we're living. So it's, it's room or rooftop to region or bioregion in every scale in between, and those scales need to, in, you know, need to be integrated and need to connect. So whole of city is, uh, so this idea that you, you uh, walk outside your, your flat or your office and you have nature all around you, and that you can move to progressively larger amounts of nature as you move out. And so uh, Helsinki is a good example of that. You can move you can, in a continuous way. You can, you can travel from the center of this pretty dense city all the way out to old growth forest at the edge of that, that city. That's very, a very biophilic city. Uh, we're imagining cities as being shared spaces. We know there's all, all, there are lots of other creatures that we co-occupy these spaces with. We, we don't necessarily, uh, uh, we're not always looking for them or, or aware that they're there, but they are. So a city is a, a biodiverse a space, and it's a shared uh, space. And here's Merlin Tuttle. You all know the story here. We, we had the delightful experience of filming Merlin right before you know, evening, one of the evening events. And we waded into the audience. It was really fun uh, interviewing you know, young kids uh, as they were anticipating you know, uh, seeing the bats. And it was just, just beautiful uh, and wonderful. And it's a kind of wildness as well, right? So we have lots of stories, uh, not, not wilderness in the city, but wildness, this concept of wild. These are images from Richmond, Virginia, where we have uh, the James River just a few hundred feet from downtown, or class four rapids. It's a, it's a beautiful, wild river. And there's a part of it that's a pipeline trail. You can actually walk on a pipeline in the river. Uh, and it's daring and not terribly dangerous, but it's a, an incredible wildness. And there's a blue heron rookery, and there are bald eagles nesting nearby. And, and the city is trying to foster this wildness and connect to this wildness. And they're, uh, they're actually talking about the, the James uh, uh, River as sort of their uh, central park. We heard earlier Central Park isn't, you know, is certainly artificially designed uh, with a certain amount of wildness there. And finding creative ways to get uh, uh, residents down to that to that water. In one case, you can't see it very well, but a very creative bridge, the footbridge and a bicycle bridge. This upper right image actually hangs down from a highway bridge crossing the highway. So it actually, it it you know moves, and you get the most spectacular views of this river as you're walking across, and it's down below you. Uh, wildness has got to be part of this. So we've been filming this uh, new film about cities and oceans. And in January, we spent a little time in Gig Harbor, Washington. Uh, part of the challenge in a biophilic city is to make that invisible nature visible. And, and we really, you know, it's part of what we need to be doing. This is a wonderful story. Uh, not a very expensive thing that they're doing, but they're, they actually uh, uh, they put up a screen uh, certain evenings and have a public event. They send a couple of volunteer divers into the water with a GoPro camera and some lights, and they send back these real-time images of the nature underwater. And a naturalist is, is talking about what's being seen in, in real time. We need to be more creative about making uh, that nature visible. This is a program called Peer Into the Night, and the organization's called Harbor Wild Watch. 
So we are very much uh, interested in, in cities that foster this wildness. Um, this is the example of Bristol in the UK. We have a few UK cities. Birmingham actually is now part of our uh, network. Uh, this idea of living in a, in a wild city. Um, you know, wouldn't you want to live in a nature reserve? Make your city a nature reserve. Same idea as you know, a city in a garden. And so a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on wildness. Uh, wi the wildlife trusts in the UK is an interesting story. And they've been fostering uh, a lot of connections to nature in a lot of creative ways. So last June, uh, they had this, 30, this campaign called 30 Days Wild, in which you were encouraged uh, to, do, to take a pledge that you were going to do at least one wild thing a day. Pretty interesting. And these were random acts of wildness is what you're supposed to do. Random acts of wild. Do some of that today, maybe. That's your third assignment on top of the other two that I. Uh, and, and actually, they've discovered, uh, uh, I guess I don't have the number, but it's something like, well, there it is, one million. They've, they've actually added up the, the, the number of <laughs> random acts of, of wildness. Some of them not so random. You know, They're kind of planned. Uh, we're going to go on a picnic, or we're going to go on a kayak uh, uh, expedition, or whatever. So wildness. And, and so uh, wildness, the, the whole of city approach, we also argue that a biophilic city uh, is one that aspires to a whole of life approach. So we want cities where you are engaged in nature from the, almost the start of your life, right? We've heard today earlier about great school-based uh, initiatives here. The school park idea is, is a really neat one here. We have lots of examples. The Key Biscayne or the Biscayne Nature Center is an, an example of that. Uh, so you ought to have that exposure as a young child, and then all the way through the other stages of your life, right, uh, into our elder years. We've made a little film about uh, Jane, Jane Rouse in her 90s, and she's a co-founder of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy and Preserve. It's a 30,000-acre um, desert preserve in Scottsdale, Arizona, we have a, a whole kind of biophilic phoenix uh, uh, initiative right now. And, and she, you know, she epitomizes what the, role, the power of nature later in life. So she goes out every day, um, gives, you know, guides groups, and does trail cleanups, and, and very engaged at that age in the nature. And her doctor tells her that you know, she, he, he's very happy her bone density is up, and her weight is down, and she's engaged. She has lots of friends. And, and she's an inspiration in, in many ways, and an inspiration and a major sort of uh, conservation figure uh, in Arizona. We're also thinking that biophilic cities um, ought to be judged a little bit differently, that the, the goalposts ought to be a little bit different, maybe, that, that, that our measures of success ought to be a little bit different. And here are two sets of examples. I mentioned St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis has just joined our network. We had a big event there two weeks ago. On the left uh, is Mayor Slay. Uh, the left image, Mayor Slay and Catherine um, Warner, who's the sustainability director. Uh, Mayor Slay is coming to the end of his, I think he's served four terms, maybe, five terms, and a very popular mayor. And he has uh, he set the, the goal of, of planting 250 butterfly gardens in the city of St. Louis, uh, Louis. Mayors promise many things, right? Planting butterfly gardens is not usually what they promise, but this has been a cornerstone of, of his, of a part of his platform. Uh, and, and actually, they've reached their 250, and now they, they've actually planted 370, I learned, and been visiting two, two weeks ago. That's an interesting metric, or an interesting way of judging the success of a city, that you might you know, live in a neighborhood where you've got butterfly gardens, and you can see butterflies. Uh, on the right, uh, images from Wellington, New Zealand, another partner city. They have a wonderful story of a wild uh, um, preserve in the middle of the city called Zealandia, where they've erected a, a predator-proof fence. And the goal there is to bring back uh, species of native birds that have been so decimated by uh, cats and other, other non-native uh, species. And it's working. Uh, what's happening is the, this is a kind of a, uh, a center of propagation, and the birds, the uh, parrots that haven't been seen in years are showing up, in, first in the neighborhoods around uh, Zealandia, but kind of you know, moving out from there. Well, the tagline is bringing birdsong back to Wellington. So one measure of success could be that we have a city where most neighborhoods, most people can hear native birdsong. 
That's an unusual metric uh, for us, but really important. We have, by the way, a lot of evidence about the, the biophilic power of birdsong. We have hospitals in the UK that are recording birdsong and then playing it back. Uh, children's hospitals are playing it back at times when, when children are going into stressful times or going into surgery or having inoculations. Uh, we're just beginning to fully appreciate that, 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 that power. Um, a lot of very interesting techniques or strategies or tools for mapping the nature. This is maybe another example of making the nature visible in a, in a city. This is hot off the press two weeks ago, uh, connecting with nature map that the city of St. Louis has prepared. You can't see that very well, but uh, butterflies, those are especially important butterfly, public butterfly gardens. This will eventually be an online map. Wellington has been piloting a very interesting online digital uh, mapping system for the nature there. Uh, and it, you can't see the icons very well, but if you go online, you can you know, hover over a bird and it will tell you what it is and, or what that place is. So it's the living nature. Um, but it's also uh, nature activities. So one of my main points about biophilic cities is it's not just the presence or absence of nature that defines a biophilic city. It's how engaged the population is. How much do we enjoy that nature? How much time do we spend outside? How much do we uh, care about that nature? Can we identify common species of flora and fauna? So it's as much about what we do in response to that nature, how we live our lives, as it is about the presence or absence of nature. So Wellington, I think every city needs something like this to guide us and make visible what's around us. Really interesting dimension to the Wellington approach uh, has to do with non-living nature. So there's a whole biophilic design community out there, and they think uh, it's just as important to talk about shapes and forms of nature, uh, uh, nature images that may not be living nature, and that's a, you know, another, another aspect of this. So this is actually a map that shows you uh, biomorphic and biophilic uh, architecture. And it, it is remarkable in Wellington. Uh, I, I don't think the Wellington, Wellingtonians even fully understand why this is the case. But they can't seem to build anything that doesn't have a reference to nature. So these are, these are um, bollards, uh, um, public space bollards in the shape of of fern uh, fronds, and uh, e even something as mundane as a, as a trash can has to have a biophilic flourish uh, of some kind, something in, you know, very embedded in the culture um, in Wellington. We need to figure it out, I think. Um, uh, biophilia is not just about what you see. Um, uh, we argue that a biophilic city is a multi-sensory city, so we are as concerned uh, about sound, for example. I forgot to load the sound file again, but uh, one of my favorite songs about this time of year and in the summer is the eastern wood thrush. I don't know if you have a thrush like that here. You have some beautiful bird sounds in this part of the world, but this is a, this is a flute-like sound that, that particularly in the evening or in the, in the early in the morning, and for me, it's a place Im embedding sound. It, it conjures, brings back all my childhood memories, calms me down, uh, and, and so, and it's a voice, as this uh, great Val Plum, Plumwood quote suggests. We've got to start thinking about what we hear. Uh, we've got to be curious about what we hear, uh, and we've got to kind of begin to think about it, about those sounds as voices. And back to this idea of co-sharing or co-inhabiting the spaces of a city with other forms of life, just kind of almost a, a more biocentric view. Um, so tell me, you're going to keep track of time. How are we doing? Oh my gosh. OK. So here is the point where I do, I start, I uh, segue into the photo essay uh, portion. And I'll just go, I'll maybe do the 20, the five, five or 10 seconds per, per slide. Um, I've already made this point, but the, we, are, we are developing a set of metrics. And all the partner cities uh, have to choose certain indicators from different categories. So again, it's not just forest canopy coverage or percentage of population within a certain distance of nature, all the kind of conventional things that we, by which we measure nature. It's also some of these other uh, things, how engaged are uh, our residents and, and how much um, investment does a city have? Um, what percentage of a city's budget you know, goes to nature, uh, as an example? Uh, I, I talk a lot about this idea of 
curiosity, the culture of curiosity, and I don't quite know, we haven't quite figured out how to, how to measure this yet, but it is indicative, I think, of, of a biophilic city. Uh, nature takes many forms, and I've made this point already. Um, we've gotten to know, uh, there's a Spanish designer, Mark Granian, who's come up with this uh, structure for uh, installing green roofs on, on the rooftops of buses. There's a couple of cities in Spain that have these buses. If you're interested, he's done a, a webinar for us. It's also on our, on our web uh, site. Uh, so we are trying to find ways to uh, understand the, the forms that nature takes in a city and whether in what ways that nature, um, you know, adds to the, the uh, contributes to kind of the minimum amounts of nature we need. Is there something uh, like a minimum daily requirement of nature? I don't know. We have evidence now that even 40 seconds of viewing nature uh, has, has positive therapeutic uh, value for us. So we've uh, very much liked this idea of the nature pyramid we're using in the, in, in the partner cities. This is the Singapore version. You know, it's modeled after the food pyramid. Uh, my colleague Tanya Dankla Cobb is actually it's originally her idea. We love it. We've kind of fleshed it out a little bit. And, and, and so Singapore is using its, all, its own species and its own projects. But like the food pyramid, it's meant to guide our nature diet. So the stuff at the top of that pyramid, like the food pyramid, they're uh, foods that we want and need in small, relatively small quantities. We've got to build that healthy diet with you know, uh, fruits and vegetables and things at the base of that food pyramid. Similarly with the, the urban nature diet, that's what we're we're, we're, we're um, proposing. So that, that may be really immersive, far away experience, visiting a national park somewhere, that's a good experience. We can't afford the carbon footprint associated with everyone going, you know, everyone satisfying their nature diet in that way. So we've got to think about what's at the base of that pyramid. And, and it's, it's local bird song, and it's uh, all, you know, all the things that might be around you um, during a day or during an hour of that day. Uh, and, and that's really what we're, five, five minutes. Okay, so uh, here really I'll translate, I promise. Now, so a really quick survey, um, Vittoria Gastez, um, the Basque country, uh, has developed a green ring. Um, by the way, we have a new book that, that has just come out that has chapters about all of these places. So there's a chapter about Vittoria uh, they're, they're doing wonderful things now to extend this idea, uh, talking about an interior green ring, if that makes sense. It does to them. It's a, a terrific idea, bringing that nature into the center of the city. So they're daylighting a major stream that runs through, through, through the city and renaturalizing that stream. Oslo, two-thirds of the city is in protected forest. The other third is densifying. They have a wonderful network of, of uh, urban trails. Uh, you see the map on the lower right. Uh, upper right is a new green plan. They're aspiring to daylight and restore the, the eight major rivers in that city that connect the, the forest and the fjord, a really ambitious plan. Uh, Milwaukee has been uh, a partner city. Wonderful examples like Alice's Garden, uh, community gardening space, but also community center. Uh, and a meeting place and a place for job generation uh, in a fairly depressed neighborhood in, uh, in that city. Milwaukee has done a lot of really interesting things to recycle land. They have this program called Ho Homegrown. Uh, and this is an example of taking two, two lots, vacant lots, and creating a park uh, uh, out of the spaces of Ezekiel Gillespie Park here. If you're interested in this, uh, they've recently done a webinar for us uh, as well. I mentioned Singapore, uh, lots of dimensions to the Singapore story, including their uh, park connectors, this network of trails and pathways that take you to, to large nature. Uh, and much of it is at the sort of forest canopy, elevated forest canopy level, really a remarkable story. Uh, and the landscape replacement policy, they also uh, have uh, significant financial um, incentives and subsidies. 50% um, of the cost of installing a green wall, for instance, is covered by, by the government. San Francisco has been uh, one of our partner cities as well, and they've done some, as you, most of you know, remarkable things with parklets and, and uh, uh, taking small urban spaces and creating parks. This is, uh, these are images from the story about their sidewalk landscape permit. Uh, uh, that they've created in that city, um, largely because of the advocacy of this person, Jane Martin, who, who lives in the Mission District. She wanted to take up some of her, her uh, the pavement in her neighborhood, 
and found the existing permitting system very onerous and expensive, so able to create this new kind of expedited sidewalk landscape permit to allow residents to do that. And there have been 2,000 of them issued since 2006. She also has done a webinar for us. Uh, Bird-friendly design guidelines in that city as well that are quite impressive. A number of our cities are doing something in the, in the way of planning and design for, for birds. This is my last slide. A number of cities uh, uh, are perched on the edge of an ocean. They're coastal, uh, have a kind of marine and aquatic dimension. Wellington has a, an extensive network of green belts, and now they're aspiring to, a, to, to develop a, a, a network of blue belts. Uh, they're surrounded by water on three sides, and much of the nature is underwater, and the biodiversity is marine. So this idea of uh, cities embedded in an integrated um, you know, terrestrial marine, integrated land, sea um, uh, landscape is, is really compelling. We're seeing a lot of cities interested in this. So uh, please, again, visit biophilicscities.org. And uh, here's the last slide that if you want to buy that book and you uh, write down this little code, that gives you a 20% uh, discount. So thank you for listening. And do we have any time for, for questions or comments at this point? Oh, we do. have that much time. OK, fantastic. Mm. Thanks. And then we do have just a pertinent Q&A. Okay. Uh, working, working. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, I won't hold it against you if you don't have an answer to this question. Well, I probably won't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I saw this video on YouTube about Yellowstone and the reintroduction of wolves. Mm. Uh, they're like a key to, keystone species, so yeah. more wolves means fewer elk, less yeah. erosion, better regulation of uh, local right. fauna. Yeah. Can you envision or imagine a similar effect in urban landscapes in managing yes. natural resources to the benefit of the economy generally or maybe just to citizens? Does that make any sense? Uh, does. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a absolutely. So I'm imagining there, there are several ways to answer that, that question. The reference to wolves and, and Yellowstone, you know, m makes me think of the strategies of cities like Edmonton. Uh, we were talking earlier today, uh, Austin is now apparently part of this uh, Lincoln Park Zoo initiative in Chicago. It's part of a new network of cities thinking about how wildlife uh, in cities, you know, thinking about the kind of ecology of, of wildlife in cities, and um, you have coyotes here, I'm, I'm assuming, yes? And they have uh, been studying this in Chicago. They have more than 100 um, camera traps uh, throughout the city, and they have learned some fascinating things about, you know, what, how, what's going on. And, and the coyotes coming in uh, have, uh, you know, the, there are certain effects that uh, apparently the, the foxes now are, are in some ways being pushed out because of the, the coyotes. And the coyotes are kind of, you know, learning, uh, adapting to those urban environments and learning how to look both ways before they cross streets. And, and, uh, and, and many cities have, uh, of course, uh, concerns about um, a, a variety of coexistence issues, including... Uh, perceived overpopulation of deer, for example. So we've got to begin to sort of better imagine that urban system as an ecosystem and begin to understand those interrelationships between the different you know, the flora and fauna that occupy that, that city. So the second part of what you asked about, though, is a little different. Bless you. Well, I think all of what I just said is to the benefit of us. Uh, that, that's one, one answer. I, I like coyotes, um, as you can tell sort of from my vision of a city as a co-inhabited co space. Uh, we've got to figure out how to coexist. We're, we're not, and it's really not optional anyway, right, with, with species like, co like uh, coyotes. They're, they're here. So if we want to coexist humanely with them, we, there are certain things we can do. Uh, for instance, they have to, we have to work hard to make sure they continue to be fearful of humans. Uh, that's the number one principle. 
Uh, but we have them. I, lo I love to hear them. I love to, to see them occasionally, but we have to co coexistence takes a active planning on our part. Uh, and, and so uh, that's true for almost all of the things that occupy cities, and they're tremendous benefits. I've just talked about birds, uh, you know, a lot. So the quality of life that we have in a city, the meaningful existence we have, to me, depends a lot on that nature, having that nature. That's why I want to have it. And uh, so uh, if you're talking about economic benefits and other kinds of benefits, which also, you know, flow from those investments. At the risk of taking up too much time and sure. answering my own question, uh, we, have, we have problems with drought in this, no. in this part, of the, yeah. part of the country. Okay. I, I imagine, you know, uh, finding ways to encourage local, local flora. Yes, a, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, back to the point about resilience and, and uh, the kinds of strategies you, the kinds of natureful strategies you employ will depend on where you are. Green roofs are not going to work in Phoenix. Uh, it's something else uh, that's working there, but it's native vegetation and it's mesquites and, and cacti and, and na very profoundly natureful things that are well adapted to that to that environment and low water and you know drought tolerant and, and all of that. And that, we need to work on all those things. Every city you're doing it here. And you're you know you're using the native palette of what you have here and, and planning accordingly. So okay, other uh, yeah. So I just want to say two things. I was going to save this till the end, but if you are leaving, please, please fill out a survey. Mm. Um, also, limit yourself to one question. Thanks. Speak it's okay. And, and speak very close speak to the microphone. Mic <laughs> okay. How's this, everybody? That's great. great. All right. All right. Um, for, first, uh, a comment, a, remem a remembrance. So you mentioned the high school students doing their homework. Yes. I remember when I was a kid, a new library opened up, and inside they yeah. had palms Oh. And it was a really great place to study, yeah. to go, to study and work and yeah. things like that. Yeah. And then also, you talked about the hotel in Singapore. They had all the, yes. the plants on the outside. Well, I yeah. remember in the 1970s, the hotel in San Francisco, the first one that opened, that had the whole indoor atrium with all yeah. the plants growing down yeah. on the inside. And that was something new back then. Yeah. And I remember being very taken with that. That's right. And that was a, you know, we've gone a long way, and we've come Since a long then, way, yeah. and we've, uh, people like Patrick Blanc, you know, who have, who have really kind of pioneered uh, you know, green walls, interior and exterior green walls. And, yeah. so, so I just want to mention that, because I just thought yeah, I think really cool making that, that nice, remember, uh, memory. remember yeah. that nice memory. But what I really wanted to ask you about was um, something that comes up, Bar Barbara Kingsolver had a really good quote, mm. unfortunately I can't remember it, but basically she said something about... Um, don't forget about the forgotten places, the forgotten nature areas. So even just a yeah. ditch, right? Absolutely. So, so my big question for you is yeah. what counts as wild? What counts as wild it's in a the city? It's a great what question. Are pigeons part of that? Yes. Um, so when we talk about those um, yeah. corridors in the cities yeah. and some of those maps that you had, yeah. do just simple tree-lined uh, streets yeah. count for that? Do yeah. houses that have balconies with little gardens, do they yeah. count along the way? Yes. Um, and how much... How much do we have people who are just walking through the trees but don't recognize them? Yeah. Because it's just part of what's there. Yeah. So how much, of, how much is that nature yeah. for a lot of people that's either, one, yeah. waking them up to it, or, two, that it's there already? So what is wild to you? Yeah. What is nature? What are you talking about yeah. in the city? Are we talking about just bringing natives back, or are pigeons okay? Or yes. are starlings okay? Because yes. they're making noises. They're singing out They are. And, and Rachel Carson asked about starlings. How, how many centuries does a starling have to be here before, before they're a citizen? Of, you know, so she had some interesting quotes about it. Uh, great question. Uh, and I think it's a point of, of discussion within the larger biophilic world. My view is all of the things you mention are in the category of nature for me. I have a, I have a, um, a doctoral student right now who's doing her thesis on spontaneous urban Spontaneous, unplanned urban nature. She has an acronym, and it's it's uh, all all about you know uh, wildflowers that pop out of you know sidewalks and yeah. Just today, actually driving in, uh, I was stopped at somewhere uh, where there's a, a highway, kind of a ledge of just you know volunteered volunteering volu volunteer uh, vegetation. That's that's wildness. So it's a wildness that we we're not as comfortable with, right? I mean we. 
uh, we worry about things that are unkept or, or abandoned or, um, and the High Line started that in that way. Uh, someone was showing a slide earlier about the High Line. We, we took this really wild, you know, elevated, abandoned, elevated rail uh, line that had all of that native, you know, not native necessarily, but volunteer uh, vegetation, and then we designed it. It's a beautiful space, but it's very designed now, you know, the James Corner. Are you saying that everybody should limit themselves to one section so they can have a variety of things that they can enjoy? And, okay. Okay. Hi. I am uh, part of a community civic group that is m working really hard to introduce the aerial gondola. Oh, okay. I've Austin. heard of this. And I heard a hiss back here. <laughs> Yikes. Uh-oh. We're, we're in a debate we're about this. Yeah. Right. Uh, do you, have you experienced city? I know there are several cities in the nation that are looking at this. There's many cities yeah. globally that yeah. have installed uh, gondolas yeah. for, transpor for uh, yeah. transportation. Do you have experience? Have you took looked at that at all? Uh, I, I don't have direct experience. I have, you know, I put on, I would put on my other hat, which is as a sort of urban planning. Did you say something really positive about it? <laughs> yeah, I know. In fact, I think when I was here in October, there was a story in the States, American Statesman about it that, that I, hadn't, I hadn't been aware of the proposal. Uh, as, you, as you undoubtedly know, it has, it has become a solution in many parts of the world where you have terrain uh, that's difficult. Well, we you have a river, uh, but in Medellin and, and, and you know, uh, yeah, Rio de Janeiro or places where, you, and it's, this is the only way to get to, to provide access for favelas. And, and so it is very successful in that context. Uh, uh, and amongst the mainstream public transit community, it's more, you know, uh, there is more discussion about it. Um, but uh, I thought actually you were going to go a different way, which was what about the nature and transit which and the gondola might be a wonderful you know way of experiencing that nature, Absolutely. and we have so some empowered. yeah it's very earth friendly and right right very small footprint yeah so we have a number of cities um, Oslo for example uh, has a, uh, mentioned these huge forest preserves and they have they have metro stations entirely for the sole purpose of getting people to to those spots and and an easy fast kind of way. And we have example San Francisco, another example of where they've, you know, the, 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 the um, cars, the muni cars, you know, they've, they've, they've purchased particular uh, styles of car with, with big windows and they're very sensitive about bay views as you're traveling in that, um, along that transit. There are a lot of kind of biophilic elements of daily life that we tend not to think as much about. And that snippet of a view or that brief inspirational on your way somewhere and it might be in a transit we'd rather have you be in that that transit you know vehicle rather than your your uh, car uh, but that's that's a biophilic experience as well so. hey um, I have one question and it's elongated though uh oh okay <laughs> uh, uh oh. Uh, no, no, well, it, it won't. Multiple parts to the question. <laughs> um, Three part what, question. Yeah. How would you define resilience? Oh. And um, how much does biophilic city um, incorporate or know about transition towns, which yeah. are related? Sure. Uh, so, do you have a transition uh, group here in Austin? Probably you started, there are probably multiple groups. I yeah. Do you all know about the transition no. movement? Um, this this is a, a more of a grassroots uh, global international movement. There are little you know uh, groups all over the world, and it's about um, sustainable living. It's about growing more food, about producing renewable energy. It's a, a kind of an eco city uh, idea. Uh, quite parallel and quite complementary to a lot of the things we talk about in sustainable communities. And I find the transition folks uh, to be very supportive. Um, and they're, you know, almost every city has a group there and they show up and they come to meetings and they, you know, and nature is, is, all, is usually, you know, is a part of that, that framework in some way. So I, I like the agenda. I don't think it's all that different uh, from what we're already talking about you know, in sustainability and resilience. 
Uh, in terms of the definition of resilience, there are a bunch of them out there. You know, there, uh, and uh, um, I have a couple of books about resilience. I'm happy to, I mean, to refer you well, to a oh, connection to this. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's interesting because a lot of people are making this connection now. So I have a good friend, uh, Jay Nichols, who's written this book, Blue Mind. I don't know if you've, any of you have come across that. I highly recommend it. It's all about the power of water. And he documents uh, the healing power uh, of surfing, for example. Nature has this remarkable ability to address you know, post-traumatic stress all those kind of things that test our resilience, our family and personal resilience. And there is this idea called ur urgent biophilia out there, uh, which is you know, a place where that resilience and biophilic, where those agendas sort of come, come together. So I think it's a powerful combination. And, uh, uh, but my, you know, I, tend to, I tend to go to fairly you know, common de definitions that intuitively that, that make sense to me, like bouncing back, you know, bending, but not breaking. Um, if, if, you can, if you can make a city more natureful, as New York and some places are doing, uh, so that, and the, the example of the, the park in Pittsburgh, uh, if, that, if, if we can you know, endure the flooding or sea level rise or a hurricane in a way, you know, we, we reimagine that shoreline as a dynamic natural system that is, is a form of nature that we enjoy and we visit and it provides access to the water, but, it, but it's also you know, resilient in the face of, 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 of those, those shocks. Um, so that's, I think, a really productive way of, of seeing this intersection. Okay, sorry, that was long-winded. When cities sign on to be partners like Austin just did, yeah. is this just aspirational or are they pledging to implement something yeah. specific? That's a great question. We, um, we make it clear that we're not in a position to certify that a city is biophilic, whatever that might mean. I mean, we're, we recognize it's an open uh, question, and it, uh, what, what makes sense and what is possible will depend on the city and the location, the context. We don't want to be another U.S. Green Building Council. We can't be that. We don't, it's not lead certification. We're not checking off boxes. We're not certifying, you know, and, and, and that's confusing sometimes. Uh, I get emails. I've gotten an email recently from folks in Birmingham. Birmingham's grappling with its green belt, and it may end up taking some of that green belt for affordable housing. So I've gotten emails. Well, how could how could how could you certify Birmingham as a biophilic city if they're doing this or that? And so it, it is aspirational, but there is there there are it, it, there are things there are requirements. So the commitment uh, by way of a resolution or proclamation adopted by city council is one of them. Uh, there is a, you can go online, there's a protocol, uh, a set of guidelines on the web page, and you can see all the things we require in the application. You have to choose, uh, commit to, to certain indicators that you, you're willing to monitor over time so you can discern, you know, discernible progress over time is, is part of what we'd like to see. Uh, there's a narrative part of it, which is how, you know, in what ways are you already biophilic? What are your aspirations for uh, the future? But basically, you're right. This is an aspirational uh, uh, initiative where the, the network is about cities coming together, voluntarily coming together to be part of a network and agreeing to help each other and to support this global movement. So if that makes sense. Given that it's aspirational, I'm curious if you've seen any attributes from cities that are better able or interested in committing to a biophilic approach, um, whether those are, and by attributes I mean demographic, uh -huh. um, governance style, something else entirely, and especially if you've seen anything that you didn't expect to see. Yeah. Um... I think maybe the obvious things, there are um, many of the cities that have been early members, uh, San Francisco, Singapore, are cities already excelling. Um, this, this is just a nice parallel uh, um, aspiration for them. It complements things they're already doing. There's a certain sensibility there. Um, so uh, I, I guess I have been a little bit more surprised to get to the second part of your, your question with some cities, Mil Milwaukee and, and Pittsburgh, 
uh, would be examples of this in St. Louis a- as well. These are, these are, this is, St. Louis is not Portland. St. Louis is not San Francisco. Decidedly not. I mean, they, uh, but yet they, this resonates for them. And they are worried about saving that last bit of prairie. And they're worried, to, you know, they want to rethink their relationship to the Mississippi River. And they want to, they're, they're really embrace, embracing butterflies. Monarch, monarch butterflies. Um, I mean, it's just remarkable to see that. Which leads me to another part of it, which is that the having champions has been a really key part of the story. So in the case of St. Louis, it's Mayor Slay and, and the sustainability director, Catherine Warner. Uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, definitely Mayor Peduto, but it's been having, uh, there's a guy named Richard Piacentini who runs the Phipps Conservatory, and he started uh, convening a group, a biophilia group, um, and had showing movies and having speakers, and I went up several times. And, and you really need champions, uh, and you need champions to get it going and to become part of the network, but also to kind of follow through, shepherd it and see, if, you know, what, where, uh, what do you want to accomplish in the, in the future. So there's a little bit, anyway, for you. Sorry. I just took that pause as, as a good time to jump yes, in. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left okay. uh, on the room, uh, the space, and I have three questions queued up, and that's wow. going to be all we have time for. Okay. Um, Do you want so to tell me the three, and I'll, or, or <laughs> I have them? I just let you know we have 10 minutes, uh, and then I have to do some closing comments. Sure. Um, one thing that you know I think is really interesting about the cities that have pledged in terms yeah. of being a biophilic city is obviously they're committed to the theory and the idea of it. But one thing I'm curious about is you know among the most successful cities, a number of which you highlighted in your presentation, what has been really like a kind of um, maybe like minimum financial investment you've almost seen? I'm thinking in terms of both wow. public and private. Yeah. Um, because you, obviously you need not only this theoretical commitment to it, but there's got to be something yeah, behind it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and it. I, I don't know that I can give you actual an actual range in in in, in numbers, but you know, S- Singapore would probably be on one side, um, and their financial commitments are you know in multiple levels over a long period of time. Um, you know, financial incentives for green things, um, you know, the cost of Regulating and planning, and and not a big surprise perhaps in Singapore, and uh, um, all the way, you know, I, I'm struck by uh, may, maybe maybe St. Louis falls into this category. I'm not sure what the you know the the uh, garden, the uh, butterfly garden initiative, for example, wasn't a terribly cost costly thing. Um, so. I am convinced, and we have examples in our network of cities that have been able to do a lot with a little bit of money. And just the example, actually, in Pittsburgh uh, of uh, having you know a little bit of food in a venue. It's not quite that simple, but um, and, and and it isn't always a city government that's taking the lead. That's another thing to keep in mind. Um, it, it you know it, it's we're finding often. So we have a group. I don't know if I mentioned the group in Philadelphia. There's a group called Biophilly that we've helped to, to form. It's the coolest name of any group, right, Biophilly. Uh, and they are, they've already organized a couple of bird design charrettes, and they're, they have a big, actually, their th- second or third major event coming up in May. Um, and they've gotten some corporate sponsors in town. And they, but it's entirely uh, um, been organized by you know, citizens. And, and, and um, there's a, an architect in, in, in town that's been really influential. They get a lot of people coming out to their uh, events, and they're pushing the city. And they want the city to be part of it. But you can do an awful lot to change the narrative and to raise awareness and lay the foundation for, you know, long, longer-term natureful, you know, programs and projects with a little bit of money, I would say. Okay, two more. So in Austin, a lot of like the kind of private green space is just privatized in the form of like people's backyards. Yeah. Uh, and another, you know, and also we focus a lot on like you know you drive to your house and then you have like green space around your house. A lot of other cities, it's more based around like you have a lot of public green space. People focus more on walking to yeah. destinations. What do you think is better fit fit for what your vision is? Well, I think we we should uh, take advantage of whatever possibility 
uh, exist. And often we have cities that, that uh, have a spectrum or a, you know, a variety of different kinds of spaces. And uh, in Milwaukee, you know, are a number of examples. You, might, you, you have very urban uh, settings, and there might be an urban vacant lot. Or, or, uh, but they're, they're also kind of more residential, you know, suburban el- parts of that same city. Um, so you need, you need a kind of palette of, of, of different strategies, e- even within a single uh, city. Most of our European uh, partners you know, have a, um, a, a kind of culture of uh, public uh, commitment to public space, and, and this, like Vitoria uh, in Spain, you know, there, there's this incredible, you know, if you want to, um, you don't have, you don't spend a lot of time in your flat, you know, you have a smaller apartment, probably you're living in a multi-story home, and you, you know, you go outside, and you stroll every evening, or, you know, where do you go to, to have that dinner or that dinner with friends, and it's, it's outside somewhere in the public realm. So you kind of have to build, I think, a little bit on the, on the culture of that particular um, place. But I do, you know, there are a lot of really cool ideas and stories for how you can take that, sub, that low-density suburban, you know, setting that many, many places have and make that profoundly more biophilic and natureful. We should also be, you know, increasing density and, and doing other things to retrofit that landscape. But, but it, bless you, it can, it can be a lot wilder and can be, um, you know, a lot more biodiverse, um, uh, you know, than it often is. Um, I wanted to ask about equity. Yeah. And, you know, in Austin, we are, I think, a biophilic city, but we're also one of the most economically segregated cities. Yeah. And I think we haven't done enough within the biophilic community to figure out how to connect biophilia to an equity agenda. And I'm wondering, you know, where you've seen that done best and how Mm. we can start to make those connections and, and advance biophilia in an equitable, equitable yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. It's a hugely important uh, question, and we're all grappling with it. And uh, I don't have a perfect story or a perfect answer. Um, I mentioned the High Line a little earlier. It's interesting. I think what's positive now uh, in our discussion about this is that we're, we're, it's front and center, so just thinking, thinking about how we presented projects like the High Line, you know, just five years ago. Uh, now, now we, you know, we're uh, not as, you know, celebratory about it. We recognize it's had some, some displacement. It's had, you know, e- um, eco-gentrification is now terminology that we commonly uh, uh, talk about. We need to figure out, uh, uh, in, in this book, there's a whole section about just biophilia. That's language, and it's kind of interesting that we've had we've had a few tweets about the book already. Somehow they've gone you know through the book and found this section. Um, it's it's on our minds, and it's it's a profound profoundly important question. Um, everybody, you know, in, is entitled to that nature, um, and we want to make sure that you have. Uh, a fair access to nature, uh, and that means trees and all the things that we know are so, tend to be associated with, with higher income and um, less minority uh, kinds of na- neighborhoods. There's a, a profound fairness there. We also don't want to um, create unintended consequences from our, our projects. So you, you probably know all about this. There's a whole uh, discussion about just green enough uh, which Jen Walsh and some other folks are kind of advocating, um, and some places that have actually adopted that strategy. I can think it's a little kooky, but the idea that we, you know, that that lower income or that minority community gets a little bit of green, a little bit of nature, not so much to uh, induce um, gentrification or displacement, but enough to provide some nature. And uh, I, I, I think we've just got to figure out how to, we need m- tools and mechanisms um, to figure out how to, you know, capture and redistribute the benefits of projects like, like the Highland, uh, Highland, uh, so, or High Line, rather, sorry, Highland. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Scotland or somewhere now. I don't know. My mind is going off there. Uh, so it's a really important uh, uh, question. So um, in the... Biophilic Cities um, Journal, by the way, take a look at that. Um, there is 
a little profile, among others, a profile of the organization Urban Relief uh, in Oakland, Oakland, California. I don't know if you know this group, but it's uh, basically a story of a group that started because essentially the you know essentially black neighborhoods in Oakland you know didn't have any didn't have a, trees were not there. The founder talks about how she she uh, she worked at the Soledad prison, and that the Soledad prison was greener than the neighborhood that she you know went back home to, and and how you know how uh, unfair and unjust that that was. So so we need to be uh, empowering. We need to be funding organizations like that. It's essentially a community tree planting group, and they're getting now funding from uh, the California Cap and Trade. Uh, program and so it's we need to put our money to where you know where our values are so it's a really a really important question so thank you for asking that thank you guys uh, and thank you Tim Beatley. sure thank you so. uh, I think Tim is gonna hang out yeah I'll hang around for a little while I know he has to drive I have to Houston, to. Yeah. So, um, First, I just want to say forest walk. I'm so ready to go do that right, well, maybe tomorrow. Uh, it's been a really long day. We've had a really awesome day uh, with Dr. Beatley talking about biophilia with city staff uh, and with you guys tonight. And I wanted to let you know, uh, what we have is Nature in the City Austin on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And that is a way for us to share our resources and information happening all over the city uh, with you guys. Sorry, uh, Nature in the City Austin. Please like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter uh, at Naturally ATX. Um, we also have a Nature in the City Austin blog that we have started, uh, and we have a Nature in the City speaker series. And if you would like to be added to the email list for that, because I will not just go and grab your name, uh, you actually have to let me know that you want to be on it. So you have to email me at Leah. L E A H dot H A Y N I E at austintexas.gov. I'm with the Community Tree Preservation Division in the Development Services Department. Uh, so you have to call 311. I'm Leah Haney. Um, yes, it's H A Y N I E L E A H. I think this is starting to short out. Um, I also have some announcements. We hopefully have a video uh, featuring Natural Austin coming into the works. It'll be focused more on social media, so it'll be a little different. We'll be working with Dr. Beatley on that. Uh, we'll soon have a web page hosting information about biophilic cities, nature in the city, uh, and hopefully contact information. So it'll be easier to sign up for the speaker series. Um, yeah, and we're actually going to hopefully launch a podcast. So we'll let you know when that comes. It says... Right, so I want to say thank you to Imagine Austin. Yes. Yeah, so three to five days, Imagine Austin speaker series website. You can Google it. Uh, and, I, and thank you to Imagine Austin for having us and Dr. Beatley here. Thank you.